Am I using this? Yeah. Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see you all. I, uh, if you um, grew up in Australia, um, you might remember seeing some certain shows on TV when I was growing up. I have a distinct memory of certain TV shows that formed part of my childhood. There was a cartoon show called Cheese TV. So I was, when I was really small, it was called Cheese TV. And as I grew up, it became Toasted TV. And that was part of my morning ritual before school. Um, they, you know, play cartoons like Dragon Ball and Pokemon and Teenage Mutant Ninja, Ninja Turtles and all those things. And then you also had shows um, during the day like Dr. Phil and Judge Judy. I don't know if you've heard of those. If you, if, if you chuck the sticky from school, then you were probably going to watch Dr. Phil on TV. It, it just always was on um, at around like 9, 10 a.m. You know, that you, you're sick, you wake up, you turn on the TV. Dr. Phil was always on. And Judge Judy, on the other hand, if you got home from school a little bit early, a bit quickly, uh, by 3.30, I think that's when Judge Judy was on. So uh, 3.30 to around 4.35, I'd watch, watch Judge Judy. Okay, I never enjoyed both shows. I didn't really enjoy Dr. Phil or Judge Judy. And if you've never seen them before, um, each episode is pretty much the same. You, you have, it's a whole lot of fighting and arguing and accusations uh, about who said this and who did what. Um, and and it's all, it just becomes a big shouting match until you know, Dr. Phil or Judge Judy says, all right, that's enough. Um, and they make their conclusion or verdict. And I watch those shows as a young child either bored and waiting for the next program to come on, or shocked at, at the crazy things that was going on. But having grown up now and reflecting on the experience of my own family and my own friends, it, it, it isn't hard to see that that sort of unpleasant conflict within families and friendship circles, uh, it's quite common. But it doesn't make it good or right. You know, psychology tells us that conflict in relationships and, and losing relationships like a marriage or like a close friend or a family member, even a breakup between a girlfriend and a boyfriend can make us feel grief as painful as losing a loved one to death. And, and these experiences of conflict are sometimes worse than losing someone to death uh, it, it leaves everyone involved exhausted and angry and bitter. And, and because they're still alive, you, you're sort of reminded of this conflict every day. That's where we find Jacob in this story, right? Jacob has tried to cut ties with his uncle Laban. And what ensues when Laban finds out that he's run away it, uh, accusations, counter accusations and heightened emotions. They, they come, it comes together in this big argument and conflict. So what's the solution for Jacob? How's Jacob going to move on from his uncle? The answer for Jacob comes finally as he appeals to a higher power. They appeal to God. They need someone, a trustworthy, unchanging person who can guarantee security and truth and protection in a world and within a relationship filled with fear and falsehood and faithlessness. So we're going to have a look at this story. We're going to look at Laban's accusations against Jacob. We're going to look at Jacob's sort of counter accusations or de defense against Laban. And then finally, we'll look at the agreement that they reach and see what all of that means for us today. How about we pray as we come to the word of God. Father, we come to your word and we ask that you would reveal to us your truth, um, point us to you and, and, and um, make bare the need that we have to turn to you and to trust in you and to rest solely in you in, in our times of conflict. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so Jacob's rich. Um, and God tells him, okay, you need to go back to the land of Canaan. His wives agree and they tell Jacob, you should do what God tells you because, you know, our, our, our father doesn't love us anyway. He, he's sort of disowned us and 
Uh, there's nothing left for us here. Let's go back to your home. And they set off, but they set off in secret, right, without telling Laban. And uh, when they, as they leave, the Bible tells us Jacob doesn't take anything that isn't his. He only takes what's his. But Rachel steals her father's gods, little figures made of wood and stone. And when Laban f- finds out like, they've snuck away, he's obviously very angry, and he chases after Jacob with his men. Probably in, he's got it in mind that he's going to teach Jacob a lesson, maybe even bring him back or, or take back his grandchildren or his daughters or, or all the, the animals and the money that he's, he's taken with him. But God appears to Le- uh, Laban in a dream, and he protects Jacob by warning Laban in, a dream, in the dream to not say anything dumb right, to Jacob. Don't say anything good or bad. Don't do anything stupid. So once Laban catches up to Jacob, he starts unleashing his anger at him. He accuses Jacob of having stolen everything that Jacob has in his possession. He accuses Jacob of forcing his daughters to go with him. And he tries to portray Jacob as this evil person who's taking advantage of a kind uncle and a kind dad a kind grandfather. I'm going to read from verse 25, and, and we'll, as we look at, once again, about what Laban has said to Jacob, take note of all the different emotions and reasons Laban is unloading onto Jacob. So from verse 25 down. Jacob had pitched his tent in the hill country of Gilead when Laban overtook him, and Laban and his relatives camped there too. Then Laban said to Jacob, What have you done? You de- you've deceived me. You've carried off my daughters like captives in war. Why did you run off secretly and deceive me? Why didn't you tell me so I could send you away with joy and singing to the music of timbrels and harps? You didn't even let me kiss my grandchildren and my daughters goodbye. You've done a foolish thing. I have the power to harm you, but last night the God of your father said to me, be careful not to say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. Now you have gone off because you long to return to your father's household. But why did you steal my God? So there's at least five different arguments that Laban is bringing to Jacob in like, he's just unleashing, right? And you, and you know what it's like. When you want to unleash, you just unleash. So what does he say? First he says, Jacob, I'm a victim here. I'm a victim of your deception. You, li- you deceived me and you carried off my daughters like prisoners of war. Maybe that's partially true because Jacob did run away w- without telling Laban, but he didn't carry off his daughters like captives. In fact, they wanted to get away from their father. So Laban is either blind to the fact that it was his own actions that have contributed to this, or he doesn't care. Second, Laban says Jacob's foolish because he says, I would have thrown a party for you. Hey, if you just told me, man, I would have thrown this massive party, we'd have this great time, and, and you'd, you'd leave. But we know that's not true because just last week we saw when Jacob wanted to leave, what did Laban do? He said, oh, no, you can't leave. Made him work for another six years and lied to him again. Third, Laban goes into, you know, poor old grandfather mode. Hey, I just wanted to kiss my, uh, my grandchildren and daughters goodbye. How could you do this to me? And then fourth, maybe he thinks nothing is working. Jacob's like, whatever. He throws in a threat, right? He says, hey, Jacob, you know I have the power to harm you. You see what he's doing? He's like, he's going through, hey, you did this. I'm the victim. Why did you deceive me? I'm just trying to do the best. I I have the power to harm you, you know. Fifth and finally, he accuses Jacob of stealing his gods. Laban is doing whatever he can to vent and unload his anger and frustration onto Jacob. Now, if you've ever had anyone unload their emotions onto you, especially to make you feel bad or guilty, then you know how unpleasant this whole thing can be for everyone involved. And we, we don't always know why conflict or why things happen in our lives. And I don't want to generalize, but just like sometimes we need to go through certain experiences to understand something about ourselves or understand something about other people, there are times when God will take us through experiences to understand something about himself, about God. God takes us through situations and circumstances of unpleasantness to teach us about, one, what it looks like to respond in a godly way and also to show us how he intervenes by his grace. 
No matter what Laban thinks he's going to get out of, you know, unleashing all this onto Jacob, whether it be just to vent his emotions or, or to hurt Jacob or maybe even to bring Jacob back and, and, or bring his daughters back and his grandchildren back, no matter what Laban thinks he's going to achieve, God is achieving something. God is doing it for Jacob's good because when we, we see here, when Laban ends his speech, he talks about God where he says, you know, I could have harmed you, but you, God, your God told me in a dream about something. And then he says, by the way, you stole my gods. What Laban is doing is, without realizing it, he's admitting that Jacob's God is able to speak for himself and protect Jacob. But his own gods cannot. They, they, someone can just steal them away. They can't even say anything to protect him, let alone themselves, because when Laban ends up going looking for them, Rachel literally sits on them. And, and, and they're not there. They can't say anything. It, it's an embarrassing position for any god, for someone to just be able to sit on them and hide them. So what does this tell us? It, it's telling us Jacob is learning and we are seeing that God is extremely capable of looking after Jacob in this time of conflict. Jacob would never have known how God protected him from Laban if Laban had not caught up with him. If Laban had not caught up with him and, and hadn't told him of the dream that, that God had given to him, that hey, yeah, your God appeared to me in a dream and said, look, I shouldn't say anything bad to you. God allows this unpleasant exchange to happen in Jacob's life and we see again how God has intervened in Jacob's life for his good to protect him. And there's something that this should make us at least consider because every single one of us will face conflict and unpleasant interactions with people. So how should we respond? It, this tells us that the first step of response is that before you make conflict personal about yourself and the other person, you need to actually make it personal between you and God because whatever the other person thinks they're going to get out of it, whether it be unleashing their emotions, or whether it be getting something back from you, the Christian must think about what God is teaching them. And remember that God means it for good to, to teach us, maybe, to rebuke us, to grow us, to consider and experience His continuing intervention in our lives. That's what's happening with Jacob. Okay, so how does Jacob respond to all of this? Well, Jacob is a human, just like all of us, and um, Jacob's had enough, right? He's like, all right, I'm trying to get away from this guy. He's chasing me. Um, I've had enough. Jacob finally bites back. He's like, you know what? Um, I'm going to bite back. I, I, you got something to say? I got something to say as well. Jacob's defense is that he has always acted with integrity towards Laban. So verse 36 down, he says, Jacob was angry and he took Laban to task. What is my crime? He asked Laban. How have I wronged you that you hunt me down? Now that you've searched through all my goods, what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of your relatives and mine. Let them ju judge between the two of us. I have been with you. I have been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams for your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself. And you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime and the cold at night, and sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for the 20 years I was in your household. I worked for you 14 years for your two daughters, and then six years more for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would surely have sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night, he rebuked you. So Jacob's defense is that he has always acted with integrity while working for Laban, shouldering any losses incurred during his shift at work, uh, making sure you know, all the animals were healthy, all the babies were healthy. 
He never, he never ate. He never, you know, dipped his hand into the cash register, you know, took 50 bucks. He never ate any of the rams that were part of the flock. He always acted with integrity is his argument. And on the whole, Jacob is right in the sense that he has been pretty innocent in the way that he's related to Laban. And he's also right in that God has been with him through it all. But there is a detail in this story because as much as Jacob thinks he's been innocent and acted with integrity, the, the, the small but important detail in this story is that actually someone in his household hasn't. Rachel has stolen his father, her father's gods. See, Jacob is so sure of his innocence and his integrity in dealing with Laban that he makes a wild promise and he says, hey, Laban, if anyone in my household is found and is guilty of stealing your little gods, then, what, then I'll, I'll kill them. The punishment will be death. Little does he know that his own wife is the culprit. This is such a small detail, but I think it's a massive lesson. No matter how clean, no matter how spotless, no matter how pure, no matter how blameless you think you are, we don't always realize how much we owe to God's providence and protection. We don't always see the danger. We don't always realize the implications of what we might say that might be hurtful or untrue. We don't always know that there could be something that condemns us, condemns us and puts us in danger when we think we are innocent. It's a fair warning for us to be humble and careful. Jacob thinks, I've got nothing to hide. You know what? I'll kill them because I, I'm that sure there's nothing wrong. The only reason why the gods aren't found is God intervenes and Rachel's life is spared. Okay, so we've heard Laban's side of the story and now we've heard Jacob's, Jacob's side. What do they need to do next? What's the next step for them? Well, Jacob and Laban, they realize that the only way that for them to move on and to move forward is by making a treaty. They make a treaty. They make a treaty by appealing to a higher power, and it's not Dr. Phil, and it's not Judge Judy, and it's not Laban's weak gods. They appeal to God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of the Bible. They set up a pillar of stones, and they call upon the name of God to be a witness and a judge for a treaty of security and peace between them. And that's the story. They have their accusations, they have their counter-accusations and defense, and they end up making a treaty in, as, with God as their witness and judge. Okay, so how do we, what lessons do we learn, or how do we apply this to, your, to ourselves? I think the first question I want to ask you is, when you think of your own life and your own experiences, who do you think you are in this story? Are you Jacob, who, you know, the one who is angry and indignant because you're confident of your innocence and you're convinced of the evil of your enemy? You're convinced that, that you, you, you're all right. You, you've done your part. And the problem is the other person. Or are you Laban? You're out to vent your fr frustrations and anger without recognizing that maybe some of it has at least has been your own doing. And you're out to accuse the other, blame others without really being able to see your part in it all. Let me, give, let me give you three lessons. First, the Bible forces us 
to recognize that while we often think we are Jacob, we might actually have to first face the fact that we are Laban. And don't get me wrong, there are real cases of real victims where it is harmful and wrong to think it was your fault, you know, to, to, that that's some sort of abuse, you know, or, or rape or disownment or, or something terrible has happened because it's your fault. No, there are real cases of real victims like that. But in saying that, the most basic requirement of the Christian faith is to recognize that you're not as good as you think you are. You're not as innocent as you think you are. See, who does Jesus continuously rebuke in the Gospels? Is it the prostitutes? Is it the tax collectors? Is it the sinners? Jesus never condones their way of life, but the group of people he continuously points out and condemns and rebukes are who? It's the religious elite, the proud, law-keeping, outward, the holy, confident people. And what does he call them? He calls them hypocrites. He calls them hypocrites because they convince themselves that by keeping these laws, they've somehow elevated themselves above these other worthless people. But when God looks into their hearts and, and when Jesus sees what they're really about, he looks past the outward holiness. He says, hey, you like to pray out loud to show off. You like to pour out loads of money into the offering bowl for people to see how generous you are. And when you walk into a building, you want people to recognize and give you the best seats in the house. You're hypocrites. You claim to be clean, but you hide your dirty heart. See, the first step to processing and resolving conflict is repentance. It has to be repentance, pointing the finger first at yourself. What is it that I need to bring to God that's in my heart that I need to admit and acknowledge and accept as unloving and unkind and ungracious and ungodly? Second lesson, the Bible tells us that God is the one who both protects and avenges the victim. See, the Bible acknowledges victims. The Bible never glosses over hurt and pain. It never says that's just... You know, that's just the physical aspect and we, all, we just have to think about the eternal spiritual stuff. It never does that. The psalmist cries out to God over his pain, the pain that's been inflicted upon him in his life and he cries out because he really believes he's innocent. And, and he cries out because he's in pain. He cries out because of injustice. And he cries out because he, he, he sees the evildoers, his enemies, who, the, the people who... He sees as guilty, they seem to be okay and, and doing well. See, the, the Bible acknowledges victims, but at the same time, the Bible does not celebrate victimhood or victim mentality. It does not give absolute power to victims because the Bible places God alone in the seat of judge. It tells us, actually, that the Christ-like thing for Christians to do is not to place themselves in the seat of judge, but to love our enemies. Matthew chapter 5, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good, and He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And then it also tells us, not just love your neighbors, or love your enemies, it says, it's not our place to seek revenge. Romans chapter 12, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone 
evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So Christians are called to an extremely high standard. To love their enemies. To pray for the people who persecute you. To repay evil with blessing. To not pursue revenge, but leave it for the Lord. Jesus will do the judging and the sorting and the condemning because he is God and he is king. He has the right, he has the authority, and he has the wisdom that is infinitely greater than our own. Third lesson, we actually need Jesus in order to face conflict. The only way for us to let go of revenge the emotions that we have for us to begin to love our enemies, to bless those who curse us, to do good. The only way for us to do that is to become people who are utterly enamored by God's forgiving love for us. See, the Bible says that when we were sinners, we were enemies of God. And we were people under his wrath. But it also says that at the same time, while we were enemies, Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the cross. In Colossians 2, 13 to 14, the Apostle Paul tells us that that forgiveness is the cancellation of our legal debt that God had every right to demand for us to pay. This is Colossians 2, 13 to 14. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. What is Paul saying? Friends, Paul is saying, God does not count your enmity. He does not count your debt against you. See, with one sin... Each of us offends God more than we can ever offend any, anyone else in our lives with a lifetime of sin. More than anyone else can offend us with a lifetime of wrong against us. One sin offends God much more than that because all sin, all wrong, all injustice, all evil, all hate is fundamentally an offense against the holy and perfect righteousness and goodness of the God who is the source of all that is right, all that is good, all that is just, all that is loving, and he's the king over the universe. See, to hate your brother or sister is to hate an image bearer of God. To abuse someone is to abuse the wondrous beauty of the God who created all things. To lie is to hate the one who is true. To be a religious hypocrite is to belittle the almighty God who shows grace towards puny and messed up people and says, you know what, I'm going to cancel the law. But if you are in Christ, and the Bible tells us, you will never have to face the wrath of God. If you are in Christ, you'll never ever have to face the judgment of a holy God who is angry against sin. You will never ever have to face an eternity separated from the one who made you, who knows everything about what life really should be. You will never ever have to face the sword of the Messiah or the verdict against sin If you are in Christ, you will only ever know the love of the Father. You will only ever know Jesus as your friend. You will only ever know the fellowship of the Spirit given to sinful people. And that 
is our power to go and do likewise. Let's pray. Father, we... know and we admit that we experience so much conflict with people, in circumstances, with sin in our own selves, and um, we're powerless to deal with it. Uh, we get into a cycle of accusations and defensiveness and all these things, and, and um, we need a treaty, we need an agreement, like Jacob and Laban, they go to you, and they say, Lord, you have to be witness and judge for our security and our safety. And Lord, um, we want to do that this morning. Help us to see Jesus, who came to cancel our debt by taking the debt upon his own self. Would that mean something for us to free us from our, from the, the desire for revenge and the anger and the hate that might be eating us up inside? Would that give us comfort if we are in times of conflict, that you are good and you are our loving Father and you are judge? And Lord, would also rebuke us and make plain to us about our own sin and our own faults, that will please help us to not be like Laban, who is blind to himself. We thank you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.